Welcome back to week six. In this continuing segment on national security, I will focus on the current developments related to the relationship between national security and freedom of expression. I have presented the international standard in the previous segment, and here I will highlight how current practices throughout the world have resulted in restrictions to freedom of expression. In the aftermath of 9-11, and then again after the attack on the French satirical magazine Charlie Hebdo in January 2015, governments have adopted a range of measures to protect national security against the threats of terrorism. The first step was the adoption of counter-terrorism law in the aftermath of 9-11. According to a Human Rights Watch report, published in 2012, more than 140 countries have passed counter-terrorism laws since the attack of 11 September 21. Human Rights Watch reviewed 130 of those laws and found that all contain one or more provisions that open the door to abuse. Among the eight elements most likely to be abused, two were directly related to freedom of expression restrictions on funding and other material support to terrorism, and limitation on expression or assembly uh, that ostensibly encourage, incite, justify, or lend support to terrorism. Now, it is not that those laws in and by itself uh, violate the international standard on freedom of expression, but the, the way they are drafted is usually very vague and very broad and therefore open the door to abuses. Over the last few years, and particularly after the attacks in January 2015 against the French magazine Charlie Hebdo, governments adopted new laws or new policies, many of which focus on internet and other means of communication. I have already spoken about the development of surveillance, including the collection of big data. In addition, policy measures have been adopted nationally and internationally to counter or prevent violent radicalization and extremism with a targeted focus on radicalization online. Academics and activists have questioned the remit of these measures and their impact on freedom of expression. I will not have the time to get into all of those critiques, but you will find uh, them in your, in your package of reading. The judicial sector is responsible for interpreting these laws and these policies. This is a very complex function, which was well summarized by uh, a member of the British House of Lords, Lord Chancellor uh, Faulkner, who observed in 20, uh, 2006, and I'm quoting from him. Courts are not conducting the fight against terrorism, nor are they deciding the measures to be used. The level of threat and the extent to which exceptional measures are required are for the executive or the legislator. The questions the court in the UK ask are, first, do these measures infringe any individual's fundamental human rights? Second, if they do, is there a justification for the infringement? And third, is the infringement the minimum necessary to protect our democracy? Giving the court the power to ask this question is essential to give effect to democratic value and to ensure the human rights compatibility of counterterrorism measures. Unfortunately, this is a role that courts and judges are finding difficult to perform, particularly when confronted with political and social pressure and a range of actual security threats. One of the main issues which was um, identified in the, the previous quote is a heavy reliance on official assessment of what constitutes national security threats. That in and by itself uh, can constitute a problem if there is no questioning of what security officials deem to be a threat. And unfortunately, this is what happened 
uh, in most cases. Judges may question the process, but they rarely question the substance of the assessment. This appears to be true of courts and judges around the world. And I'm going to illustrate these problems with two cases. The first one is an American case. It's um, a very well-known case, and again, you will find some of the analysis in your readings. Humanitarian Law Project versus Holder, Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project. So like, let me backward a little bit to 9-11 uh, first. Right after 9-11, in a few months, a few weeks after the attack, the uh, US government adopted the US Patriot Act, which um, has been very much criticized by uh, human rights uh, defenders and um, uh, academics in, in the United States. And I'm going to quote from one of the most uh, eminent First Amendment theorists who said that the uh, US Patriot Act disregarded the fundamental principle that government intrusions on civil liberties should be narrowly tailored to avoid unnecessary invasions of constitutional rights. But this is the act and it is in place. It amended, uh, among other things, anti-terrorism provisions which had been adopted in the mid-1990s and those provisions punished the provision of material support to designated foreign terrorist organizations. What the US Patriot Act did was to increase the maximum term of imprisonment from 10 to 15 years for providing material support. And it added a few more uh, forms of proscribed material support, including the provision of so-called expert advice or assistance. Um, originally, material support to terrorism included training services and personnel, which was broad enough, but yet tailored enough. Uh, or at least more tailored. By adding expert advice, the US Patriot Act is seen to have opened really uh, for some a Pandora box. So um, organizations filed a case uh, eventually that reached the US Supreme Court regarding the constitutionality of this provision. The case is Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project. Um, the court, the US Supreme Court, upheld the constitutionality of, uh, of the, the, the US Patriot Act um, and by so doing upheld the notion that the First Amendment can uh, have an exception for individuals who provide material support or resources to terrorist organizations. The court reached this decision in uh, a case where um, originally, at least, it was so that it was so borderline that possibly the, the court will, uh, will actually rule in favor of the defendant. But that was not to be the case. Humanitarian Law Project is, um, is an organization that provides training on uh, international humanitarian law, uh, among other things. So it seeks to ensure that combatants, including armed groups, so non-state actors, abide by international humanitarian law, the Geneva Convention. Um, and even in that context, the court determined that the provision of this training to, uh, to this armed group, in this case it was a PKK, this Kurdish group that is considered by the United States as a terrorist group, the court determined that the provision of this training amounted to material support to terrorism. And they disregarded the, the notion or the fact that um, the intention of a uh, humanitarian law project was a very peaceful one and indeed was seeking to ensure that combatant um, abided by international uh, humanitarian standard. The decision is complicated, and as I have mentioned, you find some analysis of it in your, in your uh, supplementary reading. But I just want to highlight here one aspect 
of the decision. The Chief Justice pointed out the difficulty for a court to evaluate the necessity of the material support provisions in a context of foreign affairs and national security. Basically, it is insisting that a court cannot judge whether or not something amounts to a security threat. Um, and I'm quoting here from the decision. The court does not defer to the government's reading of the First Amendment, but respect for the government's factual conclusions is appropriate in light of the court's lack of expertise with respect to national security and foreign affairs, and the reality that efforts to confront terrorist threats occur in an area where information can be difficult to obtain. The impact of certain conduct can be difficult to assess and conclusions must often be based on informed judgment rather than concrete evidence. The issue is that by um, insisting that it is in no position to assess the evidence provided, the court is not able to really engage in that balancing act. Uh, it's not able to assess the proportionality of the actions taken by the government because it cannot, or it determined that it cannot assess the evidence provided. Let me give you another example. In Great Britain that time, a British judgment from February 2014, which is also very reflective of the reliance on official assessment. That a judgment concerned the legality and proportionality of the detention of a journalist at Heathrow Airport and the retention of his property, including sensitive journalistic materials. The journalist in question is uh, David Miranda, and you may remember the case. David Miranda is a partner of journalist Glenn Greenwald, who reported on the classif classified information made public by whistleblower Edward Snowden. David Miranda was detained at Heathrow Airport on his way back from uh, Brazil, I believe, and is, the materials he was carrying was uh, retained by, um, by the police. Uh, the case eventually reached uh, the, the court uh, and the decisions of the judge follows quintessential national security logic and is a typical example of the unwillingness of judges to challenge uh, or to at least question official assessment of national security concern. So the judge did two things in that case. First, it argued that actually even the journalist, even an investigative journalist, is not in a position to form an accurate judgment on the matter because this would depend on knowing the whole jigsaw of disparate pieces of intelligence. Let me call from, uh, from the, the judge here. There may no doubt be obvious cases where the information on, the, on its face is a gift to the terrorist. But in other instances, a journalist may not understand the intrinsic significance of materials in his hands. More particularly, the consequences of revealing this or that fact will depend upon knowledge of the whole jigsaw of disparate pieces of intelligence to which the classes of person referred to by Mr. Greenwald will not have access. So that part of the judgment was heavily criticized because basically it, it said that um, journalists cannot assess properly national security cases, which um, is, uh, is a very extreme position. The judge also stresses that, and I quote, he had no reason to doubt any of the evidence from the Deputy National Security Advisor at the Cabinet Office, that the material was likely to cause very great damage to security interest and possible loss of life. Another problem with the cases on national security in the context of actual insecurity is the multiplication of charges and cases. The, the prosecutorial net is spread very large, capturing many speech uh, 
we should probably not be the object of such charges. I will illustrate this problem uh, with, um, with cases in France. Within two weeks of the uh, awful attacks on the magazine Charlie Hebdo, some 110 persons in France were charged with uh, apology du terrorisme, which uh, glorification of terrorism uh, or incitement to racial hatred on the basis of a law adopted in November 2014, which allowed for faster procedures, including immediate appearances in front of a court and immediate um, imprisonment. Commentators largely agree that before the uh, attacks on Charlie Hebdo, the charges of glorification of terrorism were limited to symbolic and very serious cases. This is no longer the case. In fact, the seriousness of the situation compelled one of the main union of judges in January 2015 to raise the alarm about what he described as expedited procedures, and I, I quote them here. Those procedures are based on a review of the context, rarely of the circumstances and never of the person indicted with glorification of terrorism, not for having organized demonstration of support for the authors of the attack, nor for having drafted and largely distributed their pitch but for claimers made while drunk or in anger. Convictions are raining down heavily, accompanied by incarcerations at the hearing. The, um, the reference to uh, people being drunk, drunk is actually the, the case of somebody who was drunk and uh, screamed some ridiculous statement uh, at the police saying you know, that uh, he supported jihad and uh, in, a, in a state of ebriety, and he was um, charged with glorification of terrorism um, and uh, imprisoned almost uh, immediately for several months. Judges, lawyers, and others complain of the broad definition and interpretation of the charges brought against by state prosecutors, contradicting what they say is the original objective of the legislators according to which glorification of terrorism was meant to punish the organized promotion of existing terrorist act that could bring those listening to them to radicalize or could drive them to commit terrorist act. At, at least in, in one country, France, this is no longer the case and in the aftermath of uh, the many terrorist attacks that have plagued the country, um, the government and the prosecutors have gone after individuals whose uh, speech in different contexts will certainly not have uh, gotten them into this kind of trouble. In a number of countries, the courts have upheld government's use of anti-terrorism legislation against journalists reporting on terrorism issues or indeed against political dissent. So this is one of the uh, problems that has been the most denounced by uh, academics and human rights organizations. The misuse of countering terrorism in, in a vast number of countries. I will give you a couple of examples. Uh, but they are just the tip of the iceberg. Turkey anti-terrorism legislation has been the object of many critiques from the United Nations and more recently from the European Union. At issue are the vagueness of the definition of a terrorist act, the far-reaching restrictions imposed on the right to due process, and the high number of cases in which human rights defenders, lawyers, journalists, even children and political opponents are charged under the anti-terrorism law for the free expression of very legitimate opinions and ideas. In particular, but not only, in the context of discussions related to the Kurdish issue. Um, there have been many examples over the last uh, six months in 2016 
of journalists being imprisoned uh, because they were simply reporting on the fightings happening in the east of the country. Malaysia, another example, has broadened the scope of sedition in terms of content of speech, the medium used, the audience addressed, the motivation or intent of the speaker. According to Malaysian Human Rights Group, uh, 44 people were held under the Sedition Act in 2014 against three in 2011. Another example is the use and misuse of Les Majesté. Now, uh, Les Majesté is actually, uh, in theory, it's a defamation um, uh, form of offense. It's a violation of a, of a majesty, of a king or of a queen. Uh, However, the way that those charges are being used right now uh, have brought many observers to say that Les Majesty is becoming akin to a national security charges. Uh, they are increasingly used for the protection of the reputation of public officials or of a country um, and are far more justified to, uh, with reference to national security and stability rather than reputation proper. And there too, Les Majesty charges have been, uh, have been delivered over a very broad range of content, speech mediums or, or speakers. Finally, let me finish with another matter of concern uh, related to the uh, use of national security. Uh, laws is a militarization of criminal law and criminal procedures, including uh, with regard to uh, freedom of expression issues. Special military tribunals have been set up to handle freedom of expression cases, for instance, in, in Saudi Arabia and Egypt, and I at least know of one case in Greece as well. Um, in conclusion, this is a vast topic which cannot be the object of uh, one or even two short segments. I have given you just a sense of what I perceive to be some of the many problems associated with the current responses to the threat of terrorism from the standpoint of freedom of expression. No one denies the necessity to protect a country and its population against senseless terror attacks, which may kill hundreds, if not thousands. At the time I am writing this segment, more than 220 people died in a single terror attack in a busy Baghdad street. So is spreading a wide net uh, the correct response? There is absolutely no doubt that anti-terrorism is widely misused in many parts of the world to silence legitimate political dissent and investigative reporting. I have many friends or colleagues around the world who are either imprisoned or are uh, facing charges for the very legitimate human rights work they are doing and they are charged with um, terrorism related offenses. In other countries, particularly in the West, there are fears you know, actual fears that the countering violent extremism measures stigmatize certain groups, particularly Muslims, in the current context, while failing to address the root causes of, of terrorism and the sense of grievances that is pushing certain people to act in the way they do. From the standpoint of freedom of expression and information, globally and nationally, there is no doubt that the legal measures related to uh, countering terrorism, as well as the actual act of terrorism and the judicial responses have all contributed to a sharp decline in the protection of freedom of expression. According to Freedom House, 2015 was a tenth consecutive year of decline in global freedom a trend that they have associated with countering terrorism and the Terrorism Act themselves. 
The situation has led Amnesty International to speak of a global assault on freedoms. And I will quote here from their conclusion. The misguided reaction of many governments to national security threats has been the crushing of civil society, the right to privacy and the right to free speech, an outright attempt to make human rights dirty word, packaging them in opposition to national security, law and order, and national values. Thank you.